So uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Dana Bachman. He coordinates the SOFIA's outreach program at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. He's also the lead for the NASA Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors Program at the SETI Institute. Some of you may have had an opportunity to fly. It used to be that it was uh, strictly educators, but a couple of years ago, I think for one of the cohorts, and maybe Dana could mention this, that they had opened it up where um, some of the amateur astronomers could qualify as the partner for the classroom teacher to be able to fly. And so some of you on this call, uh, on this webinar, may have even been have flown. And so if you were, let us know in the chat window and so that we can give you a call out as having um, had that opportunity. Before joining the SOFIA team, he was a professor of physics and astronomy at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. He's also the co-author of three college level astronomy textbooks and a frequent speaker on astronomy and SOFIA. His research specialty is planetary system formation in the history of the solar system. Please welcome Dr. Dana Bachman. I'm muted. Uh, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. So I have a couple of, uh, of um, meta announcements. One is I'm getting over bronchitis, and so my um, I might have. I hope I don't. <laughs> oh, there we go. I might have some coughing fits. Um, I will try to be careful. But that leads me to ask Brian. Um, if you save all the questions to the end, uh, I might not have any voice to answer them with. So could I maybe trust you to sort of field the questions and say, here's one, um, uh, maybe it could be answered now. I don't mind being interrupted to answer a question as I go along. It's probably better than saving them for the end. Okay, and if you open up your uh, Q&A window, you have access to that as well. well uh, and you can perhaps see them as, and uh, answer them as you see them, or I could uh, monitor it. If, I, if I'm blasting along giving the talk, I might not <laughs> be paying attention to the Q&A window. So if you can... <laughs> okay, I will prompt you. Okay. Okay, yeah. it might give you a nice break too, so... Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, the other point is that, uh, well, I, the, the, uh, the slides I'm showing, some of them were, are at the, uh, the, the Sophia Scientific staff showed the, briefed their, their colleagues at the International Astronomical Union with some of these slides. So these are not, uh, these are not, <laughs> excuse me, these are not <coughs> public level slides. These are, um, some of them are, are, you know, full scientific briefing level, which I think um, a lot of you are, are fine with. So, um, but then might lead to some questions. So um, now I'm going to dare to uh, try to fire up my slide set here. We had some fun getting this to work um, beforehand. So hang on just a second. Uh, so I should be, you should be, if I go do this, share screen. Uh, I hope you are seeing, I'll take it that if Brian is seeing, uh, Brian and David are seeing this uh, slideshow that you all are. Thumbs yep, up. it is looking great. Okay, um, so, um, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, 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 as, as uh, Brian said, I'm the uh, uh, lead for the SOFIA outreach effort. I'm trained as an astronomer, but my, one of my, gr my great delight is training uh, high school teachers to go on board SOFIA. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Brian had the chronology backwards. We used to bring amateur astronomers and informal educators such as museum docents on with the, uh, with the teachers. And this year, NASA asked us to change our paradigm. And so for a while, we're just doing high school teachers. I'm hoping that that gets reversed in a couple of years. But right now, it's uh, the, 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 the next two cohorts, the next two years worth of, of teachers on Sophia will be limited to uh, high school science teachers, which, um, you know, we'll do what we're told. But um, uh, it was a lot of fun with the, with the wider uh, sample of people. Anyway, so I, my, I sit at NASA Ames, which is uh, my office, 
which is about 40 miles from where Brian's and David's office is, uh, are. And, uh, um, but I am an employee of the SETI Institute, so we have a pretty complicated org chart. Now you see on Sophia here, this was one of the first open door test flights uh, from a chase plane. You see the two and a half meter primary mirror in a bag. Uh, you can see the secondary support structure and the secondary. The, the, the door rolls back and it does not all go all the way to the, uh, the zenith. So we're always looking out the port side, the left side of the plane, between elevations of between 20 and 60 degrees above the horizon. Um, the, on the tail, you see NASA's logo, but you also see the German Space Agency's logo, DLR. SOFIA is a 20% German, 80% US project. So now um, I'll go on to the next slide. Um, uh, this is a plot of atmospheric opacity versus wavelength. And um, there's, a, as you know, there's a w visual window there's sort of a near infrared window, but it's um, um, uh, it's it's uh, partly chopped up, and then uh, the far infrared, mid and far infrared are mostly blocked, uh, uh, and then the radio window opens up. Uh, uh, at <coughs> Excuse me, radio wavelength. So most at the short wavelengths, it's ozone that's doing the blocking at the longer wavelengths, infrared and uh, mid and far infrared, it's mostly water vapor that's doing the blocking. So the cure for this is you can spend a lot of money and send up a space telescope, <coughs> or you can try a small uh, mo modest sized telescope in an aircraft. This was suggested by Gerard Kuiper the astronomer who was for several decades the only planetary astronomer working uh, and was Carl Sagan's PhD advisor at the University of Chicago. Um, so we had a 10 inch telescope in a Learjet, which did uh, uh, some famous work actually. It was the 10 inch uh, infrared telescope on the Learjet that discovered that Jupiter is emitting more heat than it's receiving from the sun. Uh, it was a good work. Um, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory was its successor. It operated from 1975 to 1995 with a 0.9 meter telescope and a C-141 cargo jet, and it was based here at NASA Ames. And then Sophia is the successor, of course, to the Kuiper. Um, there was a longer gap. How, why is anybody surprised? than the, the astronomical community wanted between the, the Kuiper being decommissioned and Sophia being commissioned. That was, uh, there was almost a 15 year gap, which was supposed to have been only five years. And now Sophia is operating, and by getting above 40,000 feet, we're above 99.9% .9 of water vapor, and we have 80% of the reception of mid and far infrared that a space telescope would have. And it comes home every morning. So, so, as I said, it's a 2.5 meter uh, telescope in uh, Boeing 747 SP. That's a, a special model of the 747 that Boeing made, uh, only 40 of them, uh, which had a, a, short a short fuselage, low passenger load, and long distance capacity um, for like New York to Tokyo non stops. Um, now, that it turned out that that was not, didn't, didn't do the uh, wasn't the right price for the right uh, passenger load that the airlines wanted, and so they did stop making them, but it's perfect for us. So we bought this used from United Airlines and chopped it, and then put uh, installed the 17-ton telescope. 17 tons is the moving uh, piece um, behind a bulkhead at the tail of the plane. And it's based at NASA's facility in, in Southern California. It used to be called NASA Dryden. It was renamed after Neil Armstrong a couple of years ago. Uh, but the Mission Science Center is at NASA Ames in Northern California on the principle that you should put these things in as many congressional districts as you possibly can. Um, so as I said, it's a 20% share with the German Space Agency. Uh, they, they supply 20% of the funding they bought the high performance engines, they built the telescope, and 20% of the staff are German, and 20% of the observing time roughly goes to German 
astronomers. Um, so, oops, sorry. First science flight was in 2010. <laughs> Excuse me. We're ramping up to 120 science flights per year. We got to, I think, 70 last year. So we're most of the way up to full, uh, full capacity, not all the way. And we spend um, two to four, two to five weeks, actually, in the Southern Hemisphere based at Christchurch, New Zealand, um, in the Southern Hemisphere winter um, for Southern Hemisphere observations. There's a cross section of SOFIA. Um, and those of you who've been on it will recognize this fondly. Um, so there's a bulkhead here um, separating the cabin, where, which is shirt sleeve environment, from the telescope. So we don't send anybody back here except grad students. No, I'm kidding. Um, the uh, telescope here, um, there's a, um, uh, shown as a liquid nitrogen um, system to chill the telescope framework, which we've decided is not worth it. So this is actually not being installed. It doesn't save the time that we thought it was going to save for getting the telescope to thermal equilibrium with the stratosphere. Um, so here are workstations, telescope operators, science workstations, and the educators that I take up uh, along with two of my colleagues in rotation here at this station, pilot crew, and so on. And the, tele the instrument is mounted here, camera or spectrograph, uh, where it can be accessed from inside the cabin. So it's a Nesmith focused telescope, primary to secondary to tertiary, down the tube through the bulkhead, down this tube, and then uh, to the instrument, whatever it is that's mounted there. We leave one instrument on for a campaign of one to three weeks worth of flights because it's a full day operation to take one of these things they're usually in the range of 300 to 500 kilogram um, instruments. So they're non-trivial to take off and put on. Uh, so we, we leave one on for, um, you know, several week campaigns at a time. Here's a view on board. And, you know, the illusion is that you're looking forward, but we're looking backward to the stern of the plane. Of the, this happens to be the Cornell. <laughs> excuse me, mid-infrared camera, this red cryostat and its electronics. The uh, telescope is behind the bulkhead. Here is a counterweight. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, so this is the science team here um, and telescope operators. And this was taken from the educator console. I peer was peering over this to take, oh, take this picture of everybody happily at work at, you know, middle of the night. Um, so there'll be 20 to 25 people on board in a, a, a night, uh, including the pilot crew. Um, here are four of the instruments. Um, there's a high-speed photometer built by Lowell Observatory that's shown mounted on Sophia. Here is the near-infrared camera, uh, that, which has spectroscopic capabilities built at UCLA. It's shown here at Lick Observatory uh, near near uh, where I am, near San Jose. Um, this is the that forecast, the Cornell mid-IR camera, which also has spectroscopic imaging capability. And here's the great German uh, far-infrared spectrometer built by the Max Planck Institute. Uh, um, and this one, uh, it doesn't, it can't be used from the ground. It's the wavelengths. It's uh, it works at are completely blocked uh, from the ground. So its first operational test, other than in the lab, was when it was put on Sophia for the first time. Um, so here's a plot, might be illuminating. Uh, it's a little squish, so I could get both of the plots on the same page. But this is wavelength of observation versus spectral resolution, how finely divided the spectrum is. And of course, the, the, uh, the spectrum, the, uh, the imagers, the cameras do not have much spectral resolution. They're broadband. But uh, the great instrument goes up to 10 to the 8th. I see question and answer. Can an amateur astronomer like an NSN member submit a proposal for time on SOFIA? Should spell that with an F, S-O-F-I-A, naughty naughty. How would this be done and who decides who gets time on SOFIA? Any limitations on what would qualify? Um, any, any astronomer 
credentialed astronomer. So a PhD astronomer, uh, uh, you, you would need to be to apply, but you could find one to uh, help you uh, submit a proposal. So you could collaborate with an astronomer. Uh, any astronomer in the world can apply for time on SOFIA, but only if you're German or, or U.S. do you get government dollars to execute your observing program. Uh, uh, let's say so uh, you uh, uh, and uh, then the, so it's a yearly call for proposals like the Hubble Space Telescope or, or other space telescopes and then they're judged by a peer review panel so uh, being a member of the night sky network would would not disqualify you but you should have you should team up with a uh, uh, an academic astronomer either US or German uh, to collaborate with on the proposal, and that would uh, that would ensure the uh, consideration of it. But there's no there's no there's no exclusion principle. Anybody can apply, and then they're peer reviewed. Yeah, Dana, I'm going to give you just a, a moment to a, a break here and, and mention that I was looking for something else today and came across a, a, a PACA program. Uh, P-A-C-A, -A, Professional Amateur Collaborative Astronomy, and there is this organization that uh, I'm not sure where it's sourced out of, um, but I got to be, I, I found it because I was looking for an eclipse uh, project that was uh, funded by NASA, and this, uh, they're, they're actually doing some citizen science things uh, with collaborations between uh, professional and amateur astronomers. Okay. So um, uh, I'll just spend another minute, uh, you know, less than a minute more on this slide. But the, uh, uh, in I guess in some sort of ideal, the footprints of all of our instruments would cover this diagram. But uh, what's been the, the instruments that have been chosen for construction for Sophia cover different spectral resolutions and different wavelength ranges, so as to to be able to study very different astrophysical phenomena and the great instrument look it has a a maximum spectral resolution of 10 to the 8th which means that it would be capable of distinguishing three meter per second doppler shifts which is uh pretty amazing um anyway the, our wavelength range then is from the hippo instrument which is uh, uh uv uh, just into the near uv all the way to the mid infrared at 300 or so microns wavelength now, if you'll see a plot of how opaque the Earth's atmosphere is, um, from Mauna Kea, which is uh, where I did my graduate work and is a, a, a uh, considered a fine observing site, as you all know, um, nevertheless, the infrared is chopped up by uh, carbon dioxide, ozone, and water vapor. This is, <laughs> this is mostly lost to water vapor from 30 microns to 300 microns wavelength. But at Sophia's altitude of 12 to 14 kilometers, um, you're only seeing the ozone line, which you can't, oh no, let's see, that's, that's carbon dioxide. This is ozone, can't get rid of that because uh, we're below the ozone layer. The water vapor lines go almost completely away. So that 80% number I gave you is sort of the average, just drawing a line across here. We're getting 80% of the radiation reaching the top of the Earth's atmosphere across this range that even high mountaintops on Earth can't, uh, can't reach. Okay, so, uh, oops, what was I gonna do here? I might have shown, I was gonna show a movie. Let me do this, all right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, to dare to unshare my screen. <laughs> uh oh, uh, let's see, hang on. Okay, a new share, no, let's see, hang on, give me a break, new share, uh -huh. so I don't know if everybody's seeing a uh, grainy video from a chase, yeah, yes. seeing good, where's the door opening? We open at altitude. We don't open until we're at altitude. And we don't open if the sun's above the horizon in general. Although, for the first time last week, we, uh, uh, 
for the first time last week, we uh, um, uh, observed with the sun still um, above the horizon looking at Venus. Uh, and that was that was the first time we had violated that uh, policy constraint. Okay, let me see. Uh, okay, so so now are we looking at Jupiter? Thumbs up from David. <laughs> okay. So, in fact, this is the very first astronomical image made by Sophia in May 2010. This is a nearly contemporary, um, a few weeks earlier, but the same longitudes, roughly, of, of Jupiter. This is the infrared image combining 5.4, 24, and 37 microns wavelength. Now, um, you, you all, have, I, I, I expect everyone's familiar with the idea that Jupiter gives off more heat than it uh, receives from the sun as the, what discovered by the Learjet, an experiment on the Learjet. But this, it, this image shows for sure that it's not isotropic, that the heat upwelling is limited, <laughs> excuse me, to certain latitude bands. And this latitude band here that's showing uh, uh, outpouring of, uh, of heat from the interior is the same band that's showing the organic reddish brown organics upwelling from the interior where they've been cooked up. So you, you don't know what, everything that's going on on Jupiter unless you compare the, the visible image showing you the uh, or, organics from inside with the uh, heat map. Um, that's really uh, some real information there. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> Here is a spectral map, two spectral maps actually of Jupiter at uh, at 17 microns and 28.3 microns. These are emission lines of ortho and para hydrogen. These are two forms of the hydrogen molecule in which the 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 proton is spinning either the two protons of the two atoms in the molecule are spinning either parallel to each other or anti-parallel to each other, and the anti-parallel state is lower energy. Uh, and what this does, the ratio of the two forms of, or of uh, molecular hydrogen gives the thermal history of the gas because it, it doesn't relax, the two forms don't relax into each other on, on a short time scale, so it takes a long time to come back equilibrium so you can look at the ratio of some material and see what its temperature was years ago before the upwelling started so that's really uh, a very impressive piece of, of, of uh, astrophysics uh, looking at the thermal history of the gas that's now in Jupiter's atmosphere that's come from the interior of the planet this was done using the Xes instrument with a resolution of 55,000 that means that's the the spectral pixels, so to speak, were one fifty-five thousandth of the wavelength that that were being uh, uh, observed. Um, here is now a, a Mars, a spectrum of Mars. Um, so uh, uh, at seven point two microns, where you can see the lines of, you see these are marked here. There's carbon dioxide, we, you know, that's not exciting. But there's deuterated water, so it's uh, a water molecule where one of the hydrogens is heavy hydrogen, de uh, deuterium. And this is regular water, and this is deuterated water, and so on. The ratio of those two gives you the history of the water in the, in the atmosphere of Mars because the water is destroyed by ultraviolet. The ultraviolet photons from the sun crack the water molecules and the hydrogen escapes into space and the water rusts the rock, the oxygen rusts the rocks, but the heavy hydrogen, deuterium, escapes more slowly than the, uh, than the light hydrogen, regular hydrogen, which is called protium. There's a, there's a, obscure fact that uh, a regular hydrogen is called protium. Um, and so the abundance of deuterium is, it's overabundant relative to cosmic abundances in Mars's atmosphere, which is indications of fossil water destroyed. 
the amount of overabundance tells you that there was a certain amount of water, in fact, enough to make an ocean that's been destroyed and the deuterium has been left behind as the fossil of the, destroy, of the, of the escaped hydrogen. Uh, so this is pretty cool. It, I mean, we, we had all sorts of evidence, of course, that there's a wetter Mars, but to have this atmospheric evidence, which gets you to, lets you do some bookkeeping about how much water has been lost, <laughs> is a very, a very interesting result. Sorry. Now, lots of you know about stellar occultations. Um, where a, a, for, a foreground solar system object passes in front of a background star, and as a result, we can see, uh, measure some of the properties of the foreground object. In this case, you're seeing um, a Uranus's rings uh, passing uh, in front of a background star. This is how Uranus's rings were discovered by the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, Sophia's predecessor. So as the as the star from our point of view, as the rings crossed in front of the star, there were these dropouts, which were symmetric, more or less, around the planet. This experiment was to measure the properties of Uranus's atmosphere. They weren't expecting to find the rings, but they sure did. Um, and so some of those experimenters built one of the, those um, long ago Kuiper uh, experimenters um, built the high-speed photometer for Sophia that's used for occultation work on Sophia. Uh, and now we had in 2015, there was a Pluto occultation. And here is the ground track, the center of the track, and the uh, uh, edges of the track. So the, the difference, distance between this line and this line is actually the diameter of Pluto, which you see is about the size of Australia, pretty much. And it went right across New Zealand on a day when Sophia was in New Zealand. I mean, could you ask for better than that? Um, so, um, uh, this dot dashed line is the three, three standard deviation um, uh, 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 uncertainty in the, in the northern edge of the track. So, what, what we were, <laughs> excuse me, getting data from MIT <coughs> the afternoon of the flight of the, of the occultation so that we could uh, refine Sophia's flight path to, to try and hit the center of the, of the occultation track. And there's a particular reason that you would like to be in the center that I'll show in a moment. But uh, <coughs> um, uh, it, the position of Pluto was not well known to even like 100 kilometers precision uh, before this. Um, this is three weeks before New Horizons arrived. Uh, and the experiment was partly to pioneer to, uh, to make some measurements that might help the New Horizons people. Um, and here was the 2011 Pluto occultation light curve where there's this little bump in the middle. Uh, and I was actually on this flight. Um, uh, uh, fortunate to have been on it. And this bump in the center is, a, is what's called the central flash when the Pluto's atmosphere is lit as a ring by the star directly behind Pluto. So you have to have Sophia, Pluto, and the star mutually centered perfectly to a precision of the sort of thickness of the atmosphere, a few tens of kilometers. And then you can see a central flash for a few seconds as the as the star lights up uh, uh, the stars, at, uh, the planet's atmosphere in a ring, the dwarf planets. Um, this decrease and increase are gentler than they would be if Pluto didn't have an atmosphere. It would drop faster and come uh, drop faster and come back up faster. So you see, the total time here is a few hundred seconds. Okay. Now remember that. This is, so this is one of Sophia's instruments on the 2015 occultation. We were within 25 kilometers of the shadow track center because of the updates we were receiving um, uh, on the day of the, of the occultation. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Michael Persson from MIT and, and Jurgen Wolf from the German Sophia Institute were respectively the PIs of the two instruments that were making these observations. This happens to be from the Germans instrument because they, they let me have it first. 
Um, but here is, here is Pluto and the star not resolved. This is actually both objects uh, looking like one object, but Pluto has not covered up the star. In this picture, Pluto has covered up the star, and you're only seeing Pluto. Um, let's see. Okay, um, look at that central flash. That was the central flash um, in 2015 relative to the central flash in 2011, and we are sure that we are on the center of the track in this one, or close enough. And again here, so the central flash was much more pronounced in 2015 to 2011, indicating that the atmosphere was more extensive uh, in 2015 and 2011, which was a big puzzle uh, until the New Horizons got there three weeks later and showed that uh, Pluto is a geologically active world with apparently a, an atmosphere that that has input to it from some sort of uh, subsurface volcanism or something. Um, now let me go to uh, a little movie of that and see if I can get that to happen. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Uh -huh. Whoops, whoops, a doozy. Uh, okay. That's Sophia taking off from Christchurch, New Zealand Airport. There's the folks on board. And you'll see Pluto hide the star. It's dim. Now look for the central flash. Blink. There it is. So that's that's this is speeded up by a factor of ten. That was three minutes compressed into about twenty seconds. Um, so um, astronomers get excited by little blinking dots, um, and you do too. There you go again. Blink. Yeah. Central flash. Very pronounced. Very you know easy to see just by eye. Central flash. Uh, let's see. So now, can I can I do this one more time? Okay. Share screen. Okay. Am I back to uh, showing the? Yes. Good deal. All right. And uh, as you come back, uh, Lori had a question. Okay. And she says that Uranus is her favorite planet in the solar system. And I was actually wondering this too, because the central part of the uh, graph that you had there was chopped off. And she was wondering how many miles or kilometers apart between Uranus and its rings. Uh, it's about, um, it, 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 they're within the Roche radius, which is two and a half planetary radii. I think that they're, they're like twice the radius of the planet away. <laughs> So that's like a border, um, let's see, it's bigger than Earth, but it's, long. It's, um, it's something like uh, 30, 40,000 kilometers, roughly speaking. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. But they're, 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 with, they're within the Roche radius, which is two and a half times the radius of the planet. Okay, so here's uh, some of the close-ups of, of Pluto showing um, uh, uh, evidence of, of uh, material up, uh, from coming from the inside and covering up terrain. So something's gone on in Pluto, and that's a real puzzle if, if you're following this because Pluto's way too small and uh, for there to be a residual heat of formation and the amount of radioactive substances should not be enough to be producing this kind of activity. But the tidal interactions with uh, uh, Chiron are not enough either. Now, how am I doing for time? Oh, I see a question. Uh, on the right side of the 2015 Pluto light curve has some streaks, whereas the left side does not. Does this mean anything? Uh, let me go look. I'm, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, those, you mean these, these, uh, things here, I, <coughs> those could be noise spikes. Um, I, uh, or let me think, I want, I want to be sure that I'm not making a misstatement here. 
these are reductions in the in the cut so these are high low opacity pieces of the atmosphere uh, I, I my my guess is those are noise spikes uh, rather than anything significant but I could be wrong uh, about that So um, I have now, uh, I'm leaving the solar system and uh, showing some of Sophia's results on uh, stars and star formation. There is a protostar in the Roho Fuji uh, star forming region, oops, that um, uh, is used as a backlight. Um, so it's just a light source in behind, behind some of the uh, nebular material that let I, uh, Sophia using the great spectrometer, identify um, deuterated uh, hydro uh, hydroxyl. So instead of OH, it's OD. This is the absorption line at gig. Now these, these folks think like radio astronomers. In fact, you can think of the great spectrometer on Sophia as being the highest frequency radio receiver that's not in a lab. It, it receives at one to four gigahertz, uh, no, uh, sorry, terahertz. Uh, let's see. No, well, this is this should say terahertz. Uh, yes, yeah, so 1.4 terahertz, 1391 gigahertz. Um, uh, the so the great spectrometer is a radio receiver, whereas all of the other instruments on Sophia are are uh pixel detectors, uh, uh photo, photo, uh, uh, photo event, uh, photoelectric, um. Uh, detectors uh, converting photons to electrons. This is a radio receiver detecting the wave nature. <coughs> so these two molecules <coughs> were found by Sophia. Of course, these molecules can be found in a lab on Earth, but this is the first time they've been found in the ISM. Uh, and that adds to a list of, I don't know, 75 or 100-ish molecules already known. So it's a modest contribution, but what they're interesting, uh, why they're interesting, is they're part of the chemical pathways leading to, as it says here, water and organic molecules. So that's the that's the ultimate question operating in this that this uh, experiment was uh, was investigating was uh, what kind of chemistry goes on in interstellar clouds even before planets form, what kind of organic stuff could have formed in the cloud from which Earth and the Sun formed and, and, uh, and actually got an organic synthesis underway before there was even a solid Earth. Now here's a, an image of the star forming region Westerhout 3 in Perseus. Westerhout was a Dutch radio astronomer who made a catalog of, of H2 regions, ionized hydrogen regions, with, and this one has a massive star cluster. Now this is the Spitzer image. Spitzer had a 0.85 meter telescope and it was a space telescope. So it was cryogenically cooled. It was awesomely sensitive. It was so sensitive that W3 burned it out. Uh, and so with Sophia, which uh, you would think being less sensitive is never good, but by being less sensitive, by being not chilled to zero Kelvin, four Kelvin, but rather operating at uh, uh, stratospheric temperatures of 200 to 220 Kelvin. We're less sensitive and we have a three times bigger telescope so that we have higher spatial resolution and so we can look at the burned out, what Spitzer could only see as a burned out uh, uh, a bright area and see the structure around the protostars and the individual protostar uh, in this cloud separating them from each other. So that's what, this is just an, uh, an experiment to see what the morphology, the, sh the shapes of, of, of clusters of newborn stars are like, how, they're, uh, how they are associated, how they affect the surrounding medium. Here is an image of, um, this is a Spitzer space telescope image of the center of the Orion Nebula around the trapezium. This is a FIFI-LS, Sophia's imaging spectrometer. Uh, images of pieces of that at wavelengths of 63, 145, and 157 microns looking at neutral oxygen, neutral oxygen, and ionized carbon. 
these are spectral lines that allow these wavelengths are, are the wavelengths of spectral lines that allow the energy to leak out of collapsing interstellar clouds, hastening the collapse. So these are part of the energy budget of star formation. If, this, if these lines didn't exist, if, if the energy couldn't leak out from the interior of the clouds and escape to space, the clouds would, would perhaps be in equilibrium and wouldn't collapse. But this is like these lines operate as drains that uh, pull the plug out. <laughs> excuse me from this <coughs> from the centers of these collapsing protostellar clouds and haste, thereby hastening the collapse process. Um, theirs is another. Um, so this is ortho versus para. Uh, H2D plus, so there's a weird molecule. It's, uh, it's a tri triple hydrogen, which has got two, uh, two regular hydrogens and a sort of a deuterium taped on to it. And then we have ortho and para versions of it. And this is, uh, uh, the, the ratio gives the time since equilibrium between these two forms of the molecule were established. In other words, there's a molecular clock that tells you the age of material and lets us get an age of the star, an independent way, instead of just an estimate on a, a, or a model, this gives an age of the cloud that's forming this protostar, um, uh, which has just a telephone number for a name. So it's an age of greater than 10 to the sixth years, which actually was a surprise. They were expecting 10 to the five years based on other estimates. So this shows that that some of the knowledge of the details of star formation are not settled yet. This, this cloud was at least 10 times older than it was thought to be given the state that it's in um, uh, uh, for, for the stage that the protostars embedded in it are. Um, okay, let's see, can I get another, move on to another one? Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to skip that one. Well, no, I won't. This is actually, uh, here's an observation with the great instrument where everybody knows that stars form by collapsing interstellar clouds. Uh, yes, right, that's what everybody knows. But actually catching a cloud in the act of collapsing is very difficult because the, t the stage is so short, astronomically speaking. It's only 10 to the 5 years, the free fall collapse stage that there's it's very rare to find an object in that short astronomically short stage statistically you just have to you have to examine thousands of objects before you find one that's that's in that brief stage before the the slower contraction stage sets in of a of a protostar uh, but so that's what was done here this was an observation by Sophia that added uh, let's see I think six collapsing objects to a catalog totaling about 12 before this experiment was done. So now we're up to only 18 protostellar clouds where we're watching them collapse rather than inferring that they did collapse or inferring that they're about to collapse. So that's pretty cool. Um, this is a planetary nebula, the butterfly nebula. And here is a Hubble Space Telescope picture which shows basically the emission from the gas. And this is the oh, Sophia image where the different, different pieces of it are corresponded to each other. This shows emission from the dust that's condensing in the gas. So although I guess you could say, well, I'm looking at sort of the same thing. Look at how huge Sophia's spatial resolution is at these long wavelengths. Hubble and Sophia are virtually the same size, two and a half meter telescopes. In fact, we like to point out we're slightly larger than Hubble. Someday that, <coughs> excuse me, that won't matter. But at a wavelength of, let's say, half a, half a micron, visible light, this is Hubble's spatial resolution, diffraction limited. And this is Sophia's spatial resolution at 20 to 30 microns. Um, that's the best we can do. That's a point source at, um, at uh, the, the central star. Um, anyway, we're looking at what you're looking at here is the outflow from this object, this this evolved object, a post-main sequence star, 
the gas flowing out of it into space rejoining the interstellar medium and the dust condensing the solid particles which will then be perhaps incorporated into future generations of planets. Um, uh, let's see, this is another image of a different planetary nebula, the uh, NGC 7027, and this is an oxygen spectral image. So this is an image in the emission of oxygen atoms at this wavelength. Uh, and uh, what this is showing by going, stepping through, the, uh, through different wavelengths, through different velocities, you get the structure of the motions in the expanding uh, um, cloud, the expanding planetary nebula that's the, uh, been, been exhaled by a dying sort of solar mass star, <coughs> leaving, excuse me, leaving a white dwarf behind. <coughs> this is the spectral resolution, I mean spatial resolution, sorry, of the Sophia instrument at this tremendously long wavelength. It's like, um, uh, it's basically wavelength in microns uh, divided by 10 is your arc seconds of spatial resolution. So it's like six arc second beam here. Uh, okay. Um, now I'll, I'm, I'm, no, I'm running out of time. This is one of my favorite images from Sophia of all. This is a Hubble image of the center of the galaxy. The scale here is of just a few parsecs. Um, this is the center cluster. So it's a star cluster with about two, uh, four million, uh, two million, two, uh, a few million, I'm forgetting the right number, of stars uh, bunched up in a parsec. Imagine what the night sky looks like here, huh? it, uh, at the very center of the galaxy. Now my PhD advisor, uh, Eric Beckland, discovered the center of the galaxy by scanning over with a near-infrared detector scanning over the whole Sagittarius uh, region and finding where the stars peaked up in their density. And that was his, his PhD thesis back in 1968. Uh, well, so we know where, this, where, we know where the center of the galaxy is to a high precision from that. And right in the, <laughs> right in the center there is Sagittarius A star, this unique radio source that's associated with <coughs> that's now understood to be a supermassive black hole. Barry, uh, Barry Fitzgerald asked, how often do you refocus during these imaging sessions being that temperature I would guess remains somewhat, we, we refocus a, um, we leave the, uh, we, we refocus a few times during the night uh, the temperature of the telescope as, as it reaches equilibrium, of course, changes the metric of the telescope. Uh, <laughs> so we do have to refocus. But um, as a, a point that you might not realize is with the infrared uh, imagery, the sky is glowing. The brightness of the night sky at 10 microns is minus one magnitude per square arc second. There's a serious worth of brightness per square arc second of the night sky. And we're trying to pick out the objects behind that. So our exposure times are fractions of a second. And then we stack those images later. We can't, we'd fill up the wells and the detectors if we went for any amount of time. So we're, we're taking bursts of hundreds of, hundreds of images in a, in, in a fraction of a minute, less than a minute, stopping. And then if you need a refocus, you can just do that quickly. So refocusing is not we uh, uh, long, long, long integrations. We do that sometimes with the spectrometers, but with the imagers, um, uh, typical exposure time is a tenth of a second on Sophia. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so I wanted to show this. Um, this is what Sophia sees at 20, 32, and 37 microns. Wow, I don't see anything in common between these two pictures, do you? Oh, well, actually look now. This is a, a dense ring of molecular gas orbiting the central black hole and the center cluster. The, the center cluster is a couple of million solar masses and the center black hole is about four million. So <laughs> this is orbiting that and the, the white, white, <laughs> excuse me, this material 
um, stripped <coughs> off the inside of the torus and pouring down into the central supermassive black hole. This is hotter than the rest of the material, and it's you can see it there. Can you see signs of the denser parts of the torus as as obscurations around here? I'm, I'm running my cursor in the Hubble image, which is the same scale as the Sophia image, and you can see some of the star field is partly blacked out. That's the denser parts of this of this uh, torus. Uh, if you didn't have the, if you didn't have this image, you would have no idea what's going on in here. Not that we have a whole lot of idea anyway. But um, this, this, this show, this is, you know, the what Hubble sees, what Sophia sees. I'm, I'm case closed as far as I'm concerned, as far as Sophia being um, worth the investment uh, uh, for for the knowledge that it's bringing us about these phenomena. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I might, you know, I'll offer these slides to Brian to send out to anybody who wants them. I hope that's okay, Brian. Yeah, I would, uh, you know, we, we like to be able to post these onto the outreach resource page for this on the NSN website. Uh, I do want to uh, note that we do have, uh, uh, you might remember Missy Holzer flew with Teresa Moody on Sophia a few years ago. She's on this, and I don't know whether she's willing to... Uh, um, come on and say hello, um, but uh, you know maybe uh, you know just say hey, great great experience or something. I don't know, if, Missy. If you're willing, um, you know, feel free to uh, say hi. Yeah, um, I tell you, it was unbelievable experience to go up there for a couple different nights um, a couple years back, um, and we had the wonderful opportunity of doing it with Dana. Um, so we got the, the expertise of Dana with us, and so it was just an unbelievably fabulous experience. And what's even better now is being trained as an ambassador, is going out and sharing the word about um, Sophia, and um, you know, and, and and it just brings back such wonderful memories. And I just get so excited, and you know, I get to my Jersey girl speak, and I speak so fast because. I just loved it, and it was. Um, I just loved to share the the content of Sophia. So, terrific experience. I, I, I had a lot of fun too. <laughs> so. I skipped over some stuff. This is M eighty two. There's the supernova. This is a near infrared image of the supernova. This is near infrared spectra at wavelengths that uh, most of this spectral range does not reach even Mauna Kea. This is uh, stuff. That you couldn't do from even a mountaintop on Earth. Um, there's a there's a stretch right here that's doable from the ground, and there's another stretch right here that's doable from the ground. This is impossible from the ground. This is impossible from the ground. Um, so yeah, here. Um, so I was on board this flight, and the investigators were taking the spectrum of the supernova. And uh, and the near infrared, and this came off basically came off of the strip chart. That's not, that's not what it was. It was a display on the, on the console. And they looked at each other. They said, what is that? They had no idea, no idea what we were looking at. Are those emission lines or are those deep absorption lines between a continuum? Didn't know. Well, the paper's been published since, and it, what those are are, are cobalt and nickel Highly, highly ionized cobalt and nickel emission lines uh, produced by the supernova explosion. Uh, yeah, well, co cobalt trip, trip, uh, doubly organized, uh, doubly ionized cobalt, doubly organized, uh, doubly um, ionized cobalt, uh, singly ionized cobalt. Yeah, um, yeah. But then we were doing, we were doing groundbreaking stuff here because of the. The, the, the features, the spectral features were basically inaccessible from the ground. What you're seeing is the nucleosynthesis, as Andy Fracknoy, my, uh, our friend, Brian's and David's and my uh, buddy and colleague at Foothill College, uh, likes to say, supernovae make jewelry, right? That's uh, everything past 26 in the, uh, in the periodic table is uh, produced by a supernova. This is a spectral image of... M82 showing the motions of the gas and uh, at uh, a carbon uh, uh, neutral carbon at 157 microns, and what the investigators concluded was that they were showing, they were seeing both the rotation of the M82 galaxy more or less edge on, plus a huge galactic wind. 
You've heard of stellar winds. How about a galactic wind from the starburst? This galaxy is making 100 times, stars at 100 times the rate the Milky Way does for reasons that are maybe not well understood. It's probably due to the fact that it's being tidally affected by M81 nearby. But anyway, M82 is making 1,000 stars a year, and the Milky Way makes 10 stars a year. And, uh, and the result is this uh, um, uh, galactic wind uh, that, that we're trying to study with this experiment on the, with the FIFI-LS uh, imaging spectrometer. What have I got here? Yeah. So, uh, so Dana, we are at by the top okay. of the hour. And that was my last slide. Oh, it was. Well, that was good timing. Yeah. So, um, do you want to say something about that? Then we'll. About what? <coughs> Excuse me. Your last slide. No, I, I actually this was a do. Uh, oh, okay. Look at topic. I had two two different slides, and now I wish I'd shown this one. But it's <laughs> this was the one about the demonstrating that there actually is infall in one of these uh, protostellar objects. So okay. This shows the, the uh, red, uh, red shifted versus the system center uh, 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 of, the, of that spectral feature. Um, yeah. Well, I, I discovered in, in the chat there that not only did we have uh, Missy who had flown, but we have Helen Tavora who was in cycle two. And uh, so I, I promoted her. Um, and so she wanted to say hi as well. All these people, your, your groupies, Dana. That's <laughs> um, uh, wonderful. <laughs> hi, Dana. This is Helen. Hi, Helen. Not, not very nice that you're on. I hope that you're doing well. Yes, I am. I would just want to say that it was such a, a great opportunity to go on a flight. And we got a lot of the girls interested in science in the observatory, just because you have like a, you know, they, they have a, like a role model or something. And I show the pictures and everybody got really excited. And even the teachers who follow us, they brought more kids in the classroom in the, in the classroom for experiments. But I just have to mention that the best thing that happened to me during the flight was, was seeing the aurora of borealis from the stratosphere. That was unforgettable. I still close my eyes and I see that. We go pretty far north sometimes and uh, we get a wonderful display in the right, uh, at the right time, yes. Yeah. Well, Dana, if that's uh, the end, why don't you go ahead and uh, stop sharing? No. And uh, stop sharing. Too much sharing. And I want to, you know, we're going to wrap things up here, but I want to say thank you. You're a real trooper to uh, continue through this with uh, uh, not feeling well. And so my hat's off to you to uh, uh, continue to join us, uh, even when you were feeling under the weather. But uh, hopefully you'll get better, better soon. And I, so, I, I apologize to everyone for those um, awful noises, but um, <laughs> we got through it. Well, well, that's all for tonight, everyone. Uh, you'll be able to find this webinar, and uh, Dana, unfortunately, you're going to be immortalized in the Night Sky Network on uh, um, on our YouTube channel because we uh, post these on there. Um, you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on uh, the Night Sky Network uh, Outreach Resources section on the website. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities, and we will post tonight's presentation on, the, on our uh, YouTube channel so that you can take a look at it again and look at those slides. And we will get those slides from Dana and get those up on the Outreach Resource page.